Hey, what's up everybody? Video 44 coming at you with another video. Ignore that. Alrighty, um, so the conversation around the Lakers right now is basically all about Bronny. There's really anything else to really talk about right now. I mean, obviously the NBA Finals is going to start up next Thursday, I believe it is. Um, so of course I'm going to have a video out for that and give you my predictions beforehand but uh, I'm not in a rush to, to do homework on that necessarily I'm more so looking at prospects that's where my head is and uh, you know a lot of these guys it's like okay I know the name and I know what they can do that kind of thing I want to get to a point where I have a good 40 50 guys from this class in mind um, when I see their names like okay I know what that player is about that's that's kind of what the goal is for me before starting doing my uh uh, mock drafts of, draft as I told you guys in the last video so not quite there yet um, but I have a lot more understanding than I did probably when we last spoke I did a little homework on this guy uh, Chris Dunn I believe is his name Chris Dunn and uh, he's a hell of a weapon but he's not going to be able to help you on the offensive end at all but he's like a super genius defensively another Vanderbilt Chris Dunn another Vanderbilt um I'm really intrigued by him, man. He's out of Virginia, if I'm not mistaken. And if you're a team that has nothing but shooters and you desperately need somebody to make your defense at least a little decent, here comes a guy who can be your your future in that regard. I would love to see Chris Dunn in Indiana. Because my problem with the Indiana Pacers is that they didn't have anyone down there that I could trust would take pride in doing anything defensively. And I thought that was the difference between them being a champion really they got championship level offense in my opinion defensively they're like average at absolute best you add a Chris Dunn to their rotation and with all that they can do offensively you put him down there small forward and immediately they have someone who's going to probably draw away from their offense quite honestly but uh, like I said a defensive genius he's by far the most talented defensive player in this draft by far um and so that's what I understand. I did homework on Chris Dunn this morning. Well, watch a video. That's not real homework, but watch the video on Chris Dunn and, and got an understanding of one guy's breakdown on him. And and his defense is, is, is just, he's coming in as an NBA defender for sure. He's got more talent on the defensive end than a lot of guys in this league right now. That's that's going to be evident as soon as, soon as he touches, touches down. And in a perfect world, if you want to go all in on the defensive side of the ball, you already got a fantastic defensive team and you just don't give a damn about offense. You bring him to this team, and he, you guys can break records, like, <laughs> defensive. And that's why, you know, it would be nice if the Lakers uh, didn't have so much of a need for two-way players because we were going to have to pass on Chris Dunn. We have to because he's he's another Vanderbilt. Can't help you at all in defensive end. He's shooting, like, in the team from behind the arc. It's just bad. His offense is just – it's not even NBA level – but his defense, boy, if you had him on the same team with Vanderbilt, you're getting stops every play. It could balance out to you being a good team if you have him, Anthony Davis, and Vanderbilt on the floor at the same time. That's the reality. You're going to be one of the best defense of all time. And you'll find a way to get buckets in transition. But for the Lakers' needs, you can't do it. You can't do it. You can't go one way with your 17th overall pick. You can't do it. But I do believe Chris Dunn will be available to draft at 17 if the Lakers decide they can work with him, but I I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. But when you talk about us trading Vanderbilt, you definitely have an opportunity to, re to replace Vanderbilt if you just have to have that piece. Um, he'll be there at 17, I believe. He'll be there. And this is why for me, as I look at this draft, I'm starting to understand that I like the small forwards in our range all the way back to 30 from 17 to 30 where a lot of people think this draft is trash i got like three or four small forwards that i'm really excited about i don't think they're gonna be superstars i'm not drafting them to be that i'm i'm drafting them to be pieces pieces man guys that can just come in and take care of my small forward position for two or three years down the road they got them man and that's that's what i do see i, I call this the center's draft but you're going to find a lot of small forwards back there, too. Some good wing help is in the second half of the first round. 
and early in the second round. There's some guys, man. Um, George is his last name. You got one. Uh, as I talked to you guys about a couple other guys as well, of course, um, names are skipping my mind because I'm still fairly new to understanding who these players are. But at the end of the day, we're talking about players that can really help you defensively, offensively, some more on the offensive end, but of course in Chris Dunn's case, the defensive end especially. Uh, but there's some guys, man. If I'm the Knicks, I'm probably taking two small forwards. I'm telling y'all right now, even though the Knicks probably has other, have other needs, their range at 24 and 25 or 25 and 26 because they got two back-to-back -back picks in that range, you like, you like where you, what you can get. You definitely like what you can get in the small forward position. There are two small forwards right there. Uh, Tyson possibly could be available. George possibly available. Dunn be available. Um, you know, there's going to be some guys, man. There's a couple others that come to mind, too, uh, that I can't think of their names. But if you have to get a wing, you should not be without the ability to get them if you got a, sec a, um, <clears throat> a first round pick in that second half of that draft. I think, I think I could tell you the truth. If I could trade 17 and get two picks, if I could trade 17 for 24 and 25 with the Knicks, uh, I would be. I would not hesitate to do that if I'm the Lakers. I would not hesitate to do that. I'm just being honest with y'all because just like last year, I don't love our range, but I do like multiple players within our range. So if I can pull back a little bit and get turn two, one into two. Uh, they're players that I think can help us and get real value. Now, the, obviously, the 17th overall pick value is not two first-round picks. <laughs> yes, that's not the value of what that is. So in a perfect world, you could turn one into two, but that's not what it's actually worth. But when you're talking about having players that you want, you're likely at 17 taking a guy who could probably fall to 25. You feel me? That's kind of how the draft looks to me. Um, I do think there will be this year's Cam Whitmore as it pertains to somebody in the top eight falling all the way to 20. I think there's going to be a guy or two. It's set up that way because I think there's going to be opportunities for teams to see fits with players behind them, as I'm already kind of describing to you. Teams who have certain needs but not necessarily the best players in that prospect in the range will be the player of need. And... Again, trading down may not be in everybody's uh, best interest for whatever reason. So, I think that could potentially be a thing for some of these teams who, I don't know, if they if they really love their range. like, Or you got a team like Toronto Raptors, who, if I'm them, I would love to trade up. If I can get the 17th overall pick and I'm the Toronto Raptors... I may be willing to give you my pick here and then maybe some other stuff too um, to try to get up because they need a more talented player for what their circumstances are. And even though you got teams in their situation who don't have picks at all, they do have a, a pick that they can improve somehow. So when I think about the Rockets, and I told you guys this many weeks ago, that I think there are going to be some teams that are going to look to trade their picks just off of the strength of the traits that they've had as a team versus where they're drafting it. So you look at, like, for example, San Antonio with Wimby in place, and they got two first-round picks. Nah, they don't want to keep both of those picks. They probably want to turn both of those picks into somebody who can help Wimby win now, a player who's likely already developed, probably not too old of a guy, but somebody who's been in the league for two or three years that can match Wimby's... Um, timeline but also be ready to help him win right now get to the playoffs so if they can turn them two picks into a Franz Wagner just for example obviously I don't think that would be the case but if they could do something like that or if they could turn those two picks into a Larry Markin or something like that I think they might be willing to do that uh Houston for sure because they got all of their stuff they don't need anything out of this draft and they just so happen to have the third overall pick so what do you do well you obviously shot that you shop that, take one of them kids that you don't love so much that's in your lineup, pair him with that pick, and upgrade something.
So my prediction was that the Rockets are going to do that anyway. And now that we're in the position to see that rumor start to float, it kind of just, it's not really surprising at all. It's, 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 it's what I predicted, you know. Um, I, I think there's a chance they don't make a move. Sometimes you think teams are going to do things and they don't. But with the value of this draft being lower than most drafts, and people already telling you, hey, I want to move my pick. San Antonio talking about moving picks. I hear Memphis could be interested in moving their pick. You start to see the path to teams trading with one another. Trading down, trading up. Not necessarily giving somebody else a first-round pick. They don't have one. But moving around so that they can get a better look at the guy they want. Or maybe turn one into two, if at all possible. You think about Houston. Maybe they could turn this year's third overall pick into... Two future first rounders. That way, they can still have the equity and the value of that pick, but not necessarily adding anything to their franchise that's really young. So that possibility show, comes up. If you want to trade a couple futures, maybe you can get that third overall pick and take whoever your guy would be. So I think this is the year for that, and that's why I think my mock draft, by prediction, is already bought before I even do it, because I don't think that some of these teams that you're going to be drafting for are going to be staying in the range. So what I like to do is draft for need, not necessarily the prospect. So if I know a guy probably is the point guard in a team that uh, he's drafting that range is going to want a point guard, I'm not going to send him to that team just because he's one of those prospects. I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is make sense as if I'm the GM of their team. So by way of what it is my intentions are, I already know I'm going to have issues with my mock draft being botched off the strength of what these teams are expected to want to change within their, their range. So I know a lot of people listen to my drafts. They had the Pelicans taking the 17th overall pick. I don't think those people were aware of the pick swap situation. If they were, it wouldn't make no damn sense to predict that the Pelicans were keeping that pick at all. Made no sense at all for them to keep that pick. And now we know that the Lakers have that pick. It's official. So now they got to switch their their mocks are all already out of out of whack right this is the players that the, the pelicans would be willing to take the lakers have different needs so that changes around your whole draft board <laughs> in theory um and then you understand that the lakers could potentially move the pick as well to who who knows who knows <laughs> and that's the point so just kind of be prepared for that i tell people to be ready for the lakers to if you're a Laker fan, to possibly move the pick. Uh, I, I hate it, personally. I want I value new talent coming into the league. I'm a big, huge believer in the evolution of the game, and every generation provides the next upgrade from yesterday. So I automatically, in my mind, think that I'm going to get something better today than I would have gotten yesterday in most situations now this draft is a little different in that regard because it is a down draft to where the talent isn't up to the par with most drafts um most of your guys in the lottery right now will go in the second half of the first round this year some of the guys that were going in the second round next year would be in the first round right now if they came out so that kind of stuff is this is just a different year for that but all in all my thinking is I want the state-of-the-art next-level athlete. I don't want to bring in yesterday, yesterday's guy just because he's developed. Because I think the stronger, faster, healthier, younger guy is probably going to be a better bet than, say, going and reach for a Clint Capella at the center position, for example. I would much rather go for uh, Deron Holmes. And it's, that's just how I think. So... Off of the strength of my intentions and what I think should be done, I'm always going to lean with the side of valuing young talent and picks over uh, vets and, and some of these more developed guys in some cases, depending on what level they're on. So I just want us to, to acquire more picks, and I want all teams to think that way. And I think you'll have a much better league when you do. Much better league. But uh, it is what it is, man. you got teams like the Suns and the Lakers and the Brooklyn Nets that don't want to do that. They want, they, they want to do everything but value young talent. And as a result, you see all the talent go to different places. You see Charlotte and Houston and Orlando and Oklahoma getting all these young guys that are supposed to be on these teams 
balancing out the league the way that the league ultimately says it wants to be balanced, you have it, but you let these teams mess it up by sending double and triple picks to different teams. Half of these guys in this first round should be going to Brooklyn, should go be Phoenix, Toronto, but you keep allowing them to mortgage these picks. And as a result, all these teams who don't think like that end up hoarding all the young talent. So you have these Houston Rockets situations, Oklahoma City Thunder situations, where all the young guys are supposed to be on five or six different teams are all there at once. It's just ridiculous, man. So you talk about, oh, I want a balanced league. I want my league to, to have parity. We want each and every year to see somebody else be a champion. What you don't realize is that you're ushering the NBA into a space where super teams are far more super than what you're even putting together because each and every first round pick keep going to the same damn teams. That's what you end up having happen. So if these teams know how to draft properly or allocate the value of these picks properly, they end up getting your super team. <laughs> the same thing you don't want to happen is exactly what you're about to usher us into, David Stern. I, I mean, uh, Adam Silver. I mean, that's what it really comes down to. You only get your parity for five more minutes. Once these guys all develop at once in Houston, that's a super team right there. Oklahoma, that's a super team right there. So it's like, what you think you want, you're going to have to go about it a different way, NBA. And I think the way is to stop allowing teams, and I know this is going to suck for a lot of teams, stop allowing them to trade picks so far down the path of the future. When you can trade picks that are representative of guys that are 12 years old right now, this is the dynamic that you're ushering us into. And you could trade them for a Trey Young today when Trey Young, by at that point, will already have completed a good portion of his career, and now the new guys are all going to the same team. You know what I mean? This is what you're ushering. So I think that's the solution for the NBA, if you ask me. You stop this mortgaging of picks. You can trade this year's pick. You can trade next year's pick. Anything past that, and you're disrupting the potential parity of balance in the league. Because some of these young guys that are going to these different teams like the Rockets, they should be at the Clippers, they should be with the Lakers, they should be with the Brooklyn Nets and all these different teams that have mortgaged their picks. It's the truth, man. This is how it goes. And so when you see certain players like, oh, how the hell do you get over there? Damn, how do they grow to be such a fantastic team? How they keep getting first round picks even though they got a, they're in the playoffs? Right now, Oklahoma City has got the 12th pick overall. How the hell? That's why. That's how. So if the, if the NBA really wants to fix their, their situation, they'll stop making it so that teams can do that. And they're trying to fix it so that teams like the Lakers can't buy a championship by bringing so much salary at once to themselves. But at the same time, they're letting this happen through the back door. Like, yeah, you can't, I can't buy my team, but you're going to have Oklahoma City winning like six and seven championships in a row in 2030 because of this. <laughs> like, you're ushering them into being the next Golden State or the next San Antonio because of this. And so I just think people are not thinking about the future in a way that covers all bases necessary. I don't think so, not in the NBA. They're more so interested in the present and how they're feeling disrupted in certain things as they see certain teams are allowed to build teams a certain way. But your problem ain't that. The parity is lacking because you don't value young players and you let all these great young players go to the same damn team over and over again. So that's really what it is, man. And a lot of these teams that they go to are not great developing teams to begin with. That's why they suck so bad. That's why they have so many damn pigs. It's not just because they keep on acquiring them in trade. It's because they're the bad teams that don't develop these players very well. So what you end up having is all your first round, first pick, second pick, third pick, fourth pick, going to damn Charlotte. And Charlotte don't develop players very well. So do you end up having more busts in the league off of the strength of them going to the wrong organization? Ta-da! <laughs> Lack of parity once again. Overall talent level dropped to the floor. One conference way better than the other. That type of stuff. So, I don't know, man. And I look up and see the Houston Rockets with the third overall pick. And I look and see how bad the Eastern Conference is. 
the teams like Toronto in the 19th overall pick because they wanted to go after Jakob freaking Pirtle two years ago. That type of stuff is why the league is bad as it is. Stop allowing these owners to do this. What Phoenix is going to have to deal with over the next several years because of this decision by their owner right now is utterly crime. It, it's just, it's, it's, it should be illegal, bro, for him to be able to mortgage so much of their future at a, at a whim, whimsically. Just mortgage the entire future of the team. They don't have any first rounders or second rounders for the next four or five years. So they're relying upon older guys who are already exiting their prime to carry them past this time frame we're in right now. Kevin Durant and, Dev and, and Devin Booker, who's already entering his prime. Kevin Durant, who's going to be exiting his prime. Bradley Beals make up the third of their cap. And with no young players at all, anywhere to be found. It's, it's, it's ridiculous, man. And so that's what I want to say to you guys. Let's just, let's focus on trying to improve that area NBA improve that that's where your problem really lies it ain't in ambitious teams getting all types of superstars at a hundred million dollars and slapping them next to each other that's not where your problem really is your problem is the young talent keeps going to the same space and thus not into other teams that are keep mortgaging them away you look at the Brooklyn Nets and the Phoenix Suns they have no hope for another several several years because of this crap, man. No hope. None. Brooklyn Nets are in a terrible position. They don't even want any picks even now. Overvaluing players that are supposed to be number fours and number fives. Calling them number ones. Like, just, just like, you got to get the Matt Ishbias and, and Joe Sides out of your league, man. I can't stress this enough. You got to get these guys out of your league, man. They're not about helping the league ultimately be balanced. They're about bringing attention to their roster so that they can fill these markets with seats. They don't actually want to win. <laughs> They're like new Donald Sterlings. <laughs> they don't want to win. So that, that's frustrating because you got some real good fan bases there. Especially Phoenix, who's waiting for their first championship. They've been waiting for, what, 45 years almost? 50 years? <laughs> And here in comes this guy who wants to mortgage their entire future. So who, what ends up happening is instead of them being able to tank to be better and get your young talent, they're going to be sitting on Kevin Durant well into his 40 or 50 years, until he's 50 years old. <laughs> Hoping he keeps on playing so they can be a good team. You know, Devin Booker, praying Devin Booker don't leave them keep on taking their bag when they ain't got no future. Same thing with the Timberwolves, even though he hasn't been realized yet, they don't have any assets outside of what you see right there. Talk about continuity, they gonna have plenty of it because they can't get better. They can't move anybody to get the value that they're supposed to get for them. Rudy, Rudy Gobert stole their whole future. So whatever Minnesota is right now, they better be that. They better hope Miller develops because as these guys start to move on, in the different situations, it's going to be hard for them to keep the talent around Ant-Man that makes any damn sense. It's not realized yet. <laughs> but it will be in a couple years. When they start heading back down the standings. And their talent can't get any better. And the picks that they had keep going to Utah. I'm telling you, Utah going to have a super team if they do it right. Utah going to be winning championships soon enough if they do it right. Why? Because at the end of the day, they've been taking the Laker picks, Minnesota's picks. They got their own picks. <laughs> they got players on their team that they can trade for picks. It's like, that's going to be a super team, fam. Unless they do something to botch it. They've put together assets that come from everywhere. And all those everywhere places, they don't have that young talent coming their way. Oklahoma, Utah. You talk about a nightmare for the NBA. Picture Oklahoma City versus Utah Western Conference Finals for like six years in a row. That's what the NBA is ushering us toward. <laughs> like literally, that, that right there. OKC versus Utah, OKC versus Utah. No Lakers, no Clippers, none of these big market teams. OKC, Utah, OKC, Utah, because they're the ones with all the young talent. They're the ones that are rich enough with teams to be able to trade for all the superstars. You see what I'm talking about? I'll give it a couple years. If these teams draft properly, 
or, or make good on these valued picks, that's exactly what you're going to see. OKC Utah, OKC Utah, OKC Utah. You Houston. <laughs> that's where your talent's going to be, NBA. All going to these, those three places. This is a nightmare. But uh, yeah, man, that's pretty much my thought, dude. That's what I got to say. And then what you end up finding out is it's not going to actually manifest into multiple championships because those are small markets and those guys aren't going to want to stay there. That's what's going to the OKC and Utah are going to find that out. Them guys ain't going to want to stay there. <laughs> they may go there, but if you don't find yourself creating a San Antonio-like culture to where we want to be here to play ball, you're going to lose those guys. They're going to sign with the heat they're gonna sign with the lakers they're gonna sign with the knicks they're gonna you know feel me that's how that's gonna go so i don't know it just it looks bad i hope the nba sees what i see coming i'm trying to illustrate it for them so they understand that you can't go forward like this and expect to have parity like you're expecting it it doesn't it's not going to translate to that it's just going to translate to that in the short term but um anyway that's pretty much all the time that i have to speak um, looking forward to the finals. We've got a good one coming up. The Celtics and the Mavs. I haven't picked a team yet. I haven't done the homework, as I said at the beginning of the video. But at the end of the day, I think it could be a good finals. At least, I say it goes at least six games, one way or another. But, uh, you know, no homework has been done, so I'm not sure about that. But at the end of the day, man, that's pretty much it. I've been right sometimes. I've been wrong sometimes. And hopefully when it comes to the NBA, I hope I'm wrong, but it's, it's already in place. These assets are already there. We just got to wait for them to, to draft, them years to come around for those draft picks to ultimately be drafted. And then you're going to start seeing, oh, this is my favorite guy. Where is he? Utah. Oh, my next favorite guy. Where is he? OKC. And then that keeps happening over and over again every year. Y'all going to start understanding how frustrating it's about to be. BDL 44. I thank y'all for watching.